Uh, hi everyone, um, welcome to the session um, with the three of us up here. Uh, my name's Charlie, um, I'm kind of hosting the discussion, I'm part of the DigiHall team. Um, you might have noticed us on the stand with the uh, bright orange t-shirts in the corner. Um, I've been part of DigiHall since near enough the beginning of the journey, um, joined across as part of the, the vision I suppose um, and, and direction with sustainability. Um, but you're not really here to listen to me today, uh, I'm joined by two great guests. Uh, Martin, our CEO at Digi Hall, and Tim Greenwood, uh, Head of Logistics at m and uh, We'll give them a chance to introduce themselves in a minute, but I just wanted to give you a bit of an idea of what we're going to run through. wanted to give you a bit of a flavour of the topics we're going to cover. Um, so we wanted to give you an idea of who actually Digi Hall are. appreciate they're not kind of a household name for everybody at the moment. Um, we want to talk through the perception of su sustainability, so kind of how uh, sustainability works in the sense of it's not just what it seems on the surface. We wanted to talk through a bit about how MS and DigiHall are working together as well and show you a couple of examples of how kind of the partnership can work. We also then wanted to go into a couple of other topics around kind of asset light and asset right. We'll explain that later on. And then also influences of big data and how we're starting to use that to drive all of the sustainability drives. So uh, without a bit of further ado, Martin, Tim, I'll give it up to you guys to uh, introduce yourselves uh, in whichever order you fancy. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, hi guys, I'm Tim Greenwood. Um, I've got 20 years supply chain logistics experience uh, across uh, multiple retail, consumer and industrial uh, companies working on warehouse transport inventory solutions. I'm currently at M&S, as just said, where um, I head up the logistics, so that's the UK transport operations and logistics service function. Hi everyone, Martin Wilmore, um, so CEO of DigiHall, uh, again 20 plus years of experience in logistics and supply chain, uh, spent a long time uh, with DHL in my career uh, across multiple sectors again, aviation, technology, e-commerce and now transport with DigiHall. So we formed uh, DigiHall uh, three years ago, we're entering into our fourth year and I'm um, very excited to tell you some of the things that we're doing and how the partnership with m and continues to flourish. So thanks a lot. And I have to say at the start, I don't normally come dressed in summer uniform. I've had a, a knee operation a couple of weeks ago, so quite an interesting uh, journey this morning uh, and lots of odd looks. So I'm, 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 I'm already prepared. Just breaking a barrier, Martin. Um, so uh, just... Starts for 10, um, and before we jump into Digi Who and, and who we are, uh, we've got the Slido code in the bottom, bottom corner. We're going to run through a, a couple of the topics with Martin and Tim, but if you do have any questions, take a, a scan of the QR code, send them in, we'll cover them off at the end. We do have some time for questions. We'll equally open it up to the floor come the end. So, um, Martin, probably a good time then to start with who are Digi Hall in, in the sense. Yeah, it's a good question, get a question I get asked a lot. So um, I guess the first thing really is we're a managed transport business. So a common misconception of, of us really is around uh, a freight matching software, a freight matching tool. There's a lot of those uh, organisations in the UK. We're a managed transport business. So we don't, uh, we don't always match. We actually manage that service right from start to finish. So from that customer order, whether it's a part order, full order, we'll manage that service end to end. So that's the first piece. Second piece is we don't have any assets ourselves. So we've got no aspirations to, to run our own trucks and vehicles. We work with a number, 700 plus, secure hauliers uh, that are all compliance vetted and checked that operate on our platform. Um, and I guess the bedrock for us is three core components of our business. So one is you can't grow a business without high quality customer service, but you also can't grow a business without customers. So having scale and revenue on our platform is really important. So we're going to annualise now just over 100 million. Um, which isn't bad going, it could be better, but isn't bad going considering we're just starting our, our fourth year of operations. But we need that volume uh, to, to feed our hauliers. And without that, our haulier partners quickly lose interest. And we've seen that with other similar organisations in the past. So we now have got scale. We're doing sort of uh, between eight and 18,000 shipments a month. Um, and we're feeding that, that haulier base. Um, but our essence really is all about sustainability. That's at the core of what we do. So creating a transport community that's beyond 
you know, a single customer's network and creating a wider transport community is, well, I guess, where we got the inspiration to start the business. So um, we'll talk about that a little bit more later, but actually working beyond your own network, you can achieve really powerful things. Um, but you can only do that with good tech and good data. And that's uh, the foundation of our business. We're a cloud-based tech organization. Uh, we've got over 100 uh, developers within our tech team uh, based in Malaysia. So we're developing the system every three weeks um, in an agile sprint methodology. And we're developing that tech uh, all the time based on customer requirements and also the supply chain demands of the time, which is starting up the business in the driver crisis in 2021 you know, definitely uh, was an interesting time to launch with COVID, etc. So we've been developing constantly uh, and evolving. Um, but yeah, we're an established organisation now, which is great. Martin, I don't know whether it's worth talking through as well a bit of the process that we go through in terms of DigiHall and, and how we kind of go about covering everything. Yeah, so I promise this is the last slide. It sounds really <laughs> salesy, but... Um, you know, our, our operation is built off transport knowledge of years and years of experience. So we're not based in Silicon Valley. We're based in Hatfield, um, which is less glamorous. Uh, but this is built listening to transport operators, organisations, people on the front line, whether that's drivers, whether that's porter cabins, whether that's haulier partners. So our tech is built off making people's day-to-day -day routines easier. Um, which is a start for finish. But we cover all that end to end, much what you'd see of a typical transport operation, whether that's sourcing the right hauliers, whether that's matching the right hauliers to the right customer based on service quality, um, electronic PODs, etc. We'll do a load planning functionality. So we've got our own bespoke load planning capability where we'll take part orders and build them into FTLs, full truck loads. Um, and then we'll do that whole book into execution. All of that is end-to-end -end digital, um, fully integrated with our Hulia partners. So you get that end-to-end -end visibility. But more importantly, we can do powerful things with the data. Um, and we've got some good examples of that that we want to talk to you about later. I'd just like to say Hatfield is lovely. I live there, so it's fine. Um, Tim, uh, it's probably a good point. I know. M&S are more of the, the household name, per se, but what does the world of logistics look like for M&S? Yeah, I think you're right. I don't <laughs> need to tell you about Percy Pigs and Chinos, <laughs> but you're probably going to be less familiar with our uh, logistics network, so I'll just give you a bit of an idea of how that works and the scale. So our clothing and home and our foods businesses are, are really quite separate, and our supply chains there are quite separate historically. So our, our clothing and home, we're sourcing from... Uh, about 35 countries around the world, predominantly in Asia, mainly sea freight into the UK, a little bit of air and road. We've got some road coming from Turkey. Um, and then that's going into our NDCs and cross stock to store. On the e-com side of it, it comes out of three of our NDCs and then goes about 50% to customers' home and 50% click and collect into store. And that's via carrier network. Um, in terms of our foods operation, it's a lot of UK manufacturing, going into RDCs and going to stores. So um, a sort of average size store might get two food deliveries a day, one clothing home delivery and a click and collect delivery via carrier. So the total accumulation of that is some of the stats that we've uh, got on the screen there. So it's you know 186 million kilometers a year, which is huge, um, very, very big fleet. Um, you know, 1,400 power units and nearly 3,000 trailers. So that's a lot of kilometers on the road and a lot of CO2. And so there's lots of opportunity there, and um, uh, it's how we integrate between our food and clothing and home that we see a lot of op opportunity to uh, reduce some of the CO2 and emissions. Speaking of CO2 and emissions, uh, what, what does M&S do? We heard about Plan A in the news, but tell us a bit more about it, perhaps. Yeah, so we've, um, m, m s is really keen to be uh, sort of leading the way in terms of sustainability, and uh, has created a big program called Plan A that we're quite public about and the um, and the mission there is to be net zero by 2040, 10 years ahead of the UK government targets and a 55% reduction in emissions by 2030 from a baseline in 2017. So that's the aim. So basically we've got to get on with that. Um, the majority of our uh, emissions are actually in our, our carbon is in the manufacturing. Um, but as I've just described, we've got a big logistics operation also kicking out a lot of carbon. So we've been trying to tackle that. And uh, I, I think the, 
the bit that's always been at the forefront of my mind as I've been on this journey over the last few years is that there's lots we can do with technology and we're playing in that area. So um, I was chatting to Martin about this earlier today, but we've got 80 CNG trucks coming in, we've, we've got LNG trucks, we're procuring some HVO, but that's only going to take us so far down that journey and it feels like electric and hydrogen are quite a few years off. Um, and then the other bit that uh, I, I guess is stating the obvious is that um, it's no good being sustainable if we're not profitable and we've got wider business objectives around a structurally lower cost space and um, disciplined uh, a sort of a capital allocation. So I've got to take those considerations too. So we are investing in technologies and trialing them, but uh, the bigger opportunity, uh, well, uh, an immediate opportunity that in parallel to that we've got to go after is how do we invest heavily in systems technology and data to just get rid of empty miles to maximize every um, spare space we've got on our vehicle. And I know that's anyone who's works in logistics would say that's what they do, but we've really uh, gone quite hard after that and um, found there was even more opportunity in it than we thought. And in terms of kind of taking those empty miles off the road and, and those kind of elements of, of what Plan A is trying to do, what have we been doing kind of, I suppose, as a partnership between DigiHall and MS? Is there kind of an example that we can have a look at in terms of what we're doing between us? Yeah, all right. So I'll, if I... But a little bit more detail on that vision and how I took it forward. We, um, uh, we have one 3PL operating our clothing and home network and another 3PL largely operating our food network. And we insourced the transport management system and the people who run our control tower, brought that into m out of the 3PL. We then invested quite heavily in that technology, trying to create one tech stack across food, clothing, home, and dot com, you know, one common language around volumetrics, because it's different product types, but so that we could plan the total trailer fill, um, you know, really using machine learning to iteratively improve our trailer fill um, and our conversion of volume into how many transport legs that would be. So we've been on that journey, and a good example of this would be um, our ambient product, which is... Uh, uh, held in an NDC in Bradford is co-located with the clothing and home operation. Our clothing and home operation had a dedicated core fleet and a 3PL running it and our ambient operation was run by a separate 4PL. We managed to sit above that doing the planning of both those together, really sweating the clothing and home assets we had, the vehicles we had there, utilising our food network as well. And then for the fluctuation in volume, we used DigiHaul and for certain one-way legs where it was cost efficient as well to use DigiHaul. So just maximising our own fleet, you know, uh, harder and then using DigiHaul and one-way legs for uh, the volume fluctuations. And Martin, I suppose, is probably a good point to introduce you back in. How, how did it go kind of over the last couple of months? Well, well I think the first thing was m and were really open around data. So... You know, we, like we said earlier, we're not really a household brand or name, but one of the things that M&S were really open to was actually exploring opportunities beyond their own network. So like Tim said, very established, very mature processes, you know, know their business inside out, but how could we use our network, our wider network, and create opportunities to take empty miles off the road? So a lot of our complementary flows in our network were actually the reverse. So a lot of the volume that, that Tim talks about is ex-Bradford. A lot of our flows are actually south to north. So what we could do was use our data, industrial, industrialised data platform, DigiSite, to actually overlay the two networks and identify where Tim was running empty, where we were running empty, and actually build some round trips to take carbon out. So it's been really good for us. It's been a very exciting journey with m and 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 the volumes have grown and grown. And I think you've got some stats, in, uh, Charlie, if you click on, yeah. but I think... You know, the one thing I would say just in terms of a service provider is you have to provide that service first. So there's a real kind of obsession in the UK about running your own trucks and having your own kind of train set. And, uh, you know, a lot of that is service driven from 100 years ago. Um, but we're very unique in this country. So we operate uh, as digital in other uh, geographies. And uh, majority of organisations actually subcontract fully. So actually we're trying to push that rhetoric back about why own your own assets, why tie in a load of capex, use our network of, of, of asset light. Um, so we, we took that long life ambient opportunity, built, that, um, built the one ways, but um, the service has been great, you know, I hope you say that as well, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> um, but 
you know, we, we want to be and we have to be comparable to an own fleet operation. So those stats there, 99 plus percent, you know, making sure that our on-time performance is as good, if not better, than an own fleet is absolutely paramount. Yeah, uh, as a project, though, that was a, a good example of what we're trying to do. And we got better improved visibility end-to-end -end of the OTIF of each stage. So that's beyond DigiHall's involvement. There's a total project, it's say four million pounds as well. So going back to that point around how you get the win-win of taking empty miles off the road, which is great for our trying to reduce our, our carbon by 55% by 2030 and save some money along the way. So yeah, it was a really good successful project and DigiHall service was good. And when things did go wrong, I think it was, uh, it, it was picked up the phone to Martin and it got sorted pretty quick. Um, so yeah, it's been successful. We'll share his phone number afterwards. It's fine. Um, and service, absolutely brilliant. But how do we communicate that service? I suppose, how do we talk to each other on a day-to-day -day basis? Probably one more for you, Martin, in terms of how do DigiHall communicate that back to M&S on a day-to-day -day basis? Yeah, so I mean, we're, we're a tech company, but, you know, sounds a bit corny, but we have got that human touch. So we are a people-led business. We've got a team of 40 plus in our headquarters that are managing that service and, and like Tim says I'm on the end of the phone you know which is really important that we're not a faceless digital organization but I guess we are striving with integration to be more touchless so you know it, historically in transport operations quite people heavy pa paper heavy we're fully integrated with M&S so we take uh, the orders direct from their order management system from their logistics planning centre and that process is end-to-end -end digital so Tim quite rightly said I don't want another system I don't want my people having another system so we provide all of that data feeds all the way back up through the logistics planning centre which covers the food operation and the clothing and home operation and also click and collect vans as well so making sure that it's easy for Tim's team it's easy for our team is right but you need to do that, and the only way you do that is by good service partners from our perspective. So, you know, we've got a, a very strong team of primary hauliers that we use um, that provide us that level of visibility because it is a very traditional market, a very traditional environment, and believe it or not, it's really hard to get drivers to use apps. And, you know, even though they're probably booking holidays and doing all sorts on a phone, apparently they can't use a phone. So um, that's been a journey but very pleased to say we're in the high 90s now in terms of service transparency, which enables us to send the data back and give Tim all the visibility he needs. Yeah, so practically what that means is, uh, in terms of our core fleet, we've obviously got vehicle tracking and we get live on-time delivery in ETAs, where we are using a haulier solution through DigiHaul. We get those time stamps and that information coming back and feeding into our TMS and into our wider reporting suites, which, um, yeah, and just even in terms of the team I've got that planning all the transport, you know, we don't want to be picking up the phone or sending emails. It all can just systemically send the orders from our TMS straight to DigiHall, which does does help when it's thousands of orders a, a week you're dealing with. Brilliant. And I know we want to flip into a couple of other topics, so I'm going to move us on just briefly. But we've all kind of heard of, and you mentioned it, Martin, the asset light approach. I mean, in DigiHall, we kind of have a bit of a saying around asset right. What does that kind of mean to, I suppose, it's a good chance to explain it really to the audience? Yeah, well, I think from a UK point of view, it's probably a little bit controversial. And I, I would obviously be pushing asset light, asset light, asset light. But I understand there's a balance and also there's a legacy that we've created in this, in this country around owning, running our own trucks. But I do think there's a place to kind of rebalance um, slightly and actually leverage a wider network rather than running all your own individual controlled assets. So, you know, in order to do that, like I said, we need to provide the service and give that credibility and control. But I think the first thing for us is starts with don't hire trailers in peak, don't bring agency drivers in, just use our network, use our capacity. Um, you know, we've got a 700 plus strong haulier base. We have got very strong capacity, even first year in driver crisis. You know, through the tech, our hauliers can view our work either through a contracted flow or through the marketplace. So actually, you know, when Tim, we had a few occasions where with big spikes in volume, and we're not talking two, three, four, we're talking 100 plus loads. You know, we can turn that on within sort of 24, 36 hours, which is really important for a retailer that's 
got a very volatile trading environment and you know from a forecasting point of view it's really difficult but I know there's a time and place for trucks Tim and also <laughs> you know there's a, there's a balance to be struck yeah I, I guess um, I think probably uh, like maybe anyone else in the room that does a similar role to mine um, having having your hands on the vehicles and the assets reassures you and you feel like uh, you can control the service a little more um, I think uh, in terms of store deliveries and the complexity of that and the absolute criticality of service, I'd probably want to keep a core fleet for that. But I think having you know, positive experiences so far, I'd certainly be more open-minded to some of my primary trunking where that actually needed to be done on an owned fleet. And when we sit there and we say, okay, well, maybe there's a different option in terms of your asset balance, or maybe you should go more asset light, or maybe you should flip each away, how does DigiHall kind of go about calculating that? How do we kind of prove that and show that? And again, probably a question to you, Martin. Yeah, I mean, it's pretty simple, really. I mean, we're an island. We're a small country. So actually, it's, you know, most of the DCs, most of the RDCs are in very similar places. So, you know, I think we've got on our system, we've got over 2,000 lanes that are set up. But with a STEM mileage of kind of plus minus 10%, generally you get a, a, a concentrated heat maps around certain parts of the country and we can map that we just overlay an own fleet cost base including under utilization because often that's overlooked so you know um, typically you know a transport operation might be running somewhere between 60 and 70 percent utilized m and is much higher because obviously it's best in class um, but i think we overlay those two data sets and it's very simple you know lane based cost based what's our buy rate versus that own fleet cost including the overhead to manage look after the drivers including driver salaries that have gone through the roof so it's very much just a cost reconciliation and when the service piece of real paramount service like you said the emotive store deliveries you know um, whether it's a parcel organization trying to meet those connecting hubs sometimes there's a time and a place for owning your own assets but you know, there's also um, massive opportunity when you look at the number of movements moving around the country that are running empty. Um, it's a travesty. And I challenge if anyone that's driven here, if anyone's going on the M25 or the, the M4, I drive my family nuts about looking at whether the, the fifth wheel's up or down. So if it's up, you know, it's underutilised. If it's down, it's good. Yeah. And I suppose one of the other points in terms of that uh, I suppose as we're on the topic of big data, one of the points we're really excited about at the moment is how that's going to loop into carbon reporting and the whole kind of sustainability visualisation, if you will. Does that, how, how are we going about kind of building that, Martin? Yeah, so I mean, uh, I'll ask Tim really from a carbon point of view, because it's really important, but from a carbon reporting point of view, what we've seen is actually there's a lot of assumptions that you use rather than actual raw core data. And I think that's because some of that visibility, particularly scope three, where it's not in your direct control and it's not your own fleet, is quite difficult to predict. So with our visibility, with our GPS, with our geofences, we've got all the data we need. We've got the payload of the vehicle. We've got the emission type. We've got the vehicle type, temperature controlled versus ambient. All of that data is there. That enables us, with our partner who's highly regulated, in making sure that the, the numbers we produce are validated and regulated, we can provide absolute clarity on what carbon is. And the amount of customers we come across where those assumptions either go one way, in a good way, or actually in a negative way, you can actually you know, give reassurance to your business that you can actually reduce carbon by just becoming more accurate. Um, and then once you've got that baseline, then you look at opportunities like alternative fuels or cutting out empty running, back all matching, all that good stuff. I don't know what your view is, Tim. Yeah, not a lot more to add, really, in terms of uh, reporting all of this. It's just becoming so much more important to every company, isn't it? So we've got to report up to board level every month on all our emissions. And there's assumptions you're making in gaps. So, yeah, this is one bit that plugs one of those gaps around some of uh, those scope through emissions. And just a couple of sort of short examples, but we've, we're just launching this. So we, we launched the first phase, but you know the, the next phase of this is really taking that accurate GPS data and, and tying in with the DVLA websites. We know we're absolutely spot on. But some of our customers that we've been piloting with, 
um, you know, are amazed. They, they, they think they're running a highly efficient network because of their fleet utilisation in terms of empty running. But actually what we found with the weight payload factor, you know, they're actually less than 50 percent because they've got fresh air, you know, they're not double stacking as an example. So once you see that data, it just, it generates a conversation. So when you when you when you're basing it off assumptions, no one really's got that confidence. But when you when you've got real accurate data, it starts a good conversation about what to do differently. And then just one other small example that 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 screen on the on the right is basically our order well. Um, so, like you would in a warehouse, my majority of my time has been in warehousing. You build an order well, and then you'd hold a wave, and then you'd run your pick. So you're not single picking. You're picking five, ten, fifteen garments when you visit a pick location. We do that for transport. So we're building that order well, and then we're identifying matches, and the system's proactively telling my operators in Hatfield, you've got a match, have a look at it. Sometimes the operational complexity gets in the way. It might be a live load. It might be a temperature control versus ambient. It might, the, the collection delivery times might not quite meet. But again, it generates a conversation and actually pushing back to the customer to say, I know you've always collected that at 10, but can we collect it at two? and actually then we can build a round trip off the back of it. Um, and there's a factory clearance operation in um, Colford, Gloucester, and we've recently done, done that solution. It was built off an own fleet solution, but we've managed again with reverse flows to save that customer 32% in their transport cost per annum. It's massive. Might have got lucky on that one occasion, but I think there's a lot more to go at. Perfect. Thank you very much, chaps. Um, I think it's probably a good point to wrap up because I know you guys are probably going to have a couple of questions to ask, um, but we just wanted to kind of summarise it all together with a, a final slide and, and by all means take a scan of the QR code, fire in any questions and we'll, we'll get Slido up and running. Um, but we just wanted to summarise and just say, look, sustainability is not just alternative fuels and electric, it is about digitalisation, it's about process, it's about the systems that sit behind it as well. And actually by taking kind of an open-minded mindset as a business, as a company, as an individual, that might unlock new things, whether it's a 4PL control tower solution, reviewing asset balance, looking at backhaul matching. There's a number of different options there that aren't just doing it as electric or alternative fuels. So thank you very much, Martin and Tim, but uh, happy to open it up to the floor to any questions. If not, then uh, we can have a quick check of the slide if there's anything from you guys. Do you want me to yeah, run the it. mic down? Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. So, quick question for me. So, how are you fostering the relationships with your subcontractors? How are you building those partnerships with your primary haulers? It's been a journey, to be honest. It's been a learning curve because I think um, when we first started, we didn't have that volume. So, you know, you have to, it just boils down to relationships, really. So, first of all, the strategy was get as many as we can on. Uh, really target owner operators, small independents, a um, bit like the Amazon model kind of thing, really. Uh, but what we've learned actually is having fewer but much closer relationships enables you to deliver that service quality, whether that's uh, your full integration, you know, making sure their drivers are, are fulfilling and using the app. So for me, relationships are key. So I know the primary hauliers we use, I know the owners of all of those organisations and I spend a lot of time with them. I think the other thing as well is how do we um, make their business more efficient? So they're really bought into sweating the assets. So we did actually an open book, uh, open book um, programme with a few of our hauliers where we were looking at the impact of wheels turning and actually if they're turning their wheels 20, 20 hours a day they're so much more profitable and then they can reduce our rates for us and that's where the sweet spot is then we can give discounts to, to big customers so um, for us making sure their wheels are turning as, as many hours a day as possible sounds really simple um, but and also paying them quicker so a lot of the big uh, 3PLs pay 60 days 90 days we pay standard 30 days, but we've also, for our primaries, we've got a fast track payment. So we'll pay in three days. Um, so from a cash flow point of view, particularly if you're factored as a haulier, um, that's, that's, that's powerful, you know, because they actually don't need that factoring relationship there. They can just get paid a lot quicker through us. So I think it's, it's real basics, but pay them quick, make sure they're busy is the, is the nub of it, really. 
Good question. Anyone else from the floor? We've got one on Slido here, um, and this one's probably more towards Tim, I suppose. But uh, what do you think is the biggest benefit of working with DigiHall? Oh. <laughs> Quite nice and easy one. I did that one earlier. Co cover, yeah. cover your ears, Mark. <laughs> working with you, Charlie. <laughs> I, I think it's, um, you know, when, when we get into our busy peak periods, you have to use subcontractors. And I think the biggest thing has been the fact that uh, at that point of the year, in M&S, we'll quite often spend because it, we go from being, you know, everything being about cost when we're in this time of year to in that run up to Christmas, it will just be like, don't care, you're not dropping it. And DigiHall were able to respond and find traction when we needed it. And having had some fixed rates, not paying over the odds, that's probably the bit I'd say. That's a good answer. <laughs> Anybody else from the floor? We've got another one here from Slido then. Um, and probably one for Martin, but do you plan to deploy LTL and planning tools in the system at all? Yep, so we've got load planning capability now. So we've just built that. We didn't intend to do that from the start, but it's been a, a clear kind of requirement from our customers coming through. Um, so we've got that capability. We just, just launched that now. Um, what's the other one? Uh, an, uh, LTL operation. LTL, LTL we do. I mean, there's different definitions of LTL. So we do, we do groupage. We do multi-drop, multi-collection. Um, but we don't do cross docking, so we don't do multi collect into a cross dock centre, multi drop, um, because at the moment there's not really the requirement for us. Uh, and we've got really good pallet network providers, so we'll often have affiliate relationships with those guys. So if we can't service it, then we'll hand it over to the, to those guys. So never say never on the on the um, on the pallet cross dock side of things, but at the moment there's not a requirement to do it. Don't know how, how long we got. Still got a couple of minutes? Because we've still got a couple of questions. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, I suppose another one for you then, Martin. Um, how do you manage the operation and audit your hauliers? Yep, so we've got a, a whole team of people. It's a big backbone. You know, I guess for a digital business, we have got significant overhead and investment, um, but we've done that deliberately to provide that wraparound care. And I think um, one of the other elements in terms of working with a lot of hauliers, so a lot of big retailers, big customers have to work with maybe 10, 20, 40, 50, sometimes 100 plus. So what we can do is take that pain away. So we're, we're a one-stop shop. So um, our, all of our hauliers go through rigorous compliance vetting, whether that's public liability, all the insurance you need. Uh, and the system sends reminders whether they're, if that's coming up for expiry, whether that's to the haulier or whether it's to my team. And it is very clear rule set. So hauliers will not be able to see the work. They won't be able to see the activity, even if they're a primary haulier. So uh, the system has got those rule sets built into it. So obviously if they're not compliant, they're not compliant, we won't use them. But also for things like hazardous goods, pharmaceutical goods, um, waste management, BRC accreditation, all of those rules are built into the system by project. Um, so not too many restrictions on Tim's side other than the more road haulage compliance, um, but some, some customers are really quite complex in how they operate. So that, that, that's how we, they're, they're just removed if they're, if they're non-compliant. The other thing that we do that I don't think many other like-minded companies do is we work with an independent to do vetting. So in the av aviation industry, where I used to work, uh, we used to have the Civil Aviation Authority that used to be the conscience of our operation. We have a similar organisation that we use. Um, so he will be out on the road, he'll be visiting haulier sites, he'll be watching a driver unload a vehicle, he will be visiting their head office, asking for documents, checking Ops 13 checks, all of those good things that then come back into our team and then inform the hauliers to make sure that they're not sub subcontracting. Um, there's a direct correlation. So all the things that have kind of been staple and almost accepted or turned a blind eye to, we're making sure we've got that diligence um, out there. Um, so you know, I think it, give, it helps me sleep at night, making sure that um, you know the people that we're using are, are tried and trusted. And um, probably one for to wrap up with Tim. Um, Around Plan A, what do you see as the main contributor to, towards sustainability? Is it 
electric vehicles and, and alternative fuels? Is it the other bits? Is it equal? Oh, there's probably better experts in the room than this than me. Um, uh, in terms of uh, our emissions, though, 90% plus is actually in the manufacturer. Um, so it's, it's scope three in the manufacturer of uh, the product. But in terms of UK logistics, um, yeah, I, I guess I, I probably thought electric would be here by now, and it still seems quite a long way off. But it is going to be, I'm being told, electric and hydrogen. But in the meantime, we're, we're having some success with gas. So um, uh, we're, with CNG, we're getting, you know, 80 to 90% less uh, CO2 and LNG just a little bit below that. Um, so there are some solutions now, but I think the end game is probably going to be hydrogen or electric, but timeline, I, I certainly can say. Brilliant. Um, and we just had another one come in. Um, are you expanding outside the UK? So I suppose that's a, a DigiHall question rather than a, an m &S one, perhaps. Yes. <laughs> yeah, so we've got a... Um, We've got a business in Mexico now. So where I was saying about UK is quite unique. In Mexico, everything subcontracted. So uh, we only started in July last year. So it's still pretty, pretty small uh, out there. I think annualised are around 10, 12 million. Um, but that's our, um, you know, big growing market in in that business. It's pretty much growing organically, 15 to 20 percent every year. And a lot of the organisations there really, they're really struggling with capacity. So it's almost like going back to UK 2021 when the driver crisis and people couldn't get their hands on enough vehicles. But I think there's enough vehicles, but people aren't using the data to work more efficiently and collaborative and actually provide that visibility. So believe it or not, in Mexico, a lot of the haulage is done by farmers off season. Um, so those farmers need the visibility of where the work's available. So it's very much more your owner operator marketplace type um, activity, whereas opposed to here, it's much more around data analytics and really squeezing the pips out of the operation. Uh, so, so, so that's one operation. Uh, Thailand will be live before June, and then Philippines um, at the end of this year. Uh, and we've got our cross-border uh, functionality uh, that's delivered now. So we're now doing pan-European movements into and out of Europe uh, and Ireland as well. So um, no plans at the moment to be based in Europe. Um, it's quite saturated with uh, digital freight businesses and it's quite a, an aggressive market with certain businesses buying up market share. Um, but yeah, you know, never say never. I think the opportunity for us is some of those long distance and if we can build the round trips with pan-European volume, where the spend's a lot higher, the, the, the benefits and opportunities should be, should be pretty good as well. So that's the plan at the moment. So busy, busy times. Um, anyone else from the audience? Or oh, we've got one more to wrap up with. You keep saying that. I keep saying that, but they keep sending them in. So. <laughs> it's good. Um, do you have to use Digi Hauliers, or can we use our own? as in owners and customer. Yes. Yeah, so what we operate, we did this actually with, with uh, Marks and Spencers, and, and in particular the, home, uh, the food side of business because um, of the chilled and frozen requirements. So we've got our own primary hauliers, but if a customer feels really, really passionate about using their own particular haulier, and it tends to get, the passion tends to get more passionate the lower down the organisation you get because that's where the relationships are, you know, in the, in the transport operations. Uh, we're happy to onboard an existing haulier as long as they fit with our compliance requirements uh, and as long as they deliver the service. And I think what we have seen is where that, is pa where that passion is, I need to use that person because, you know, they sponsor my son's football team. Um, we'll do that, but often the data and the service, you know, isn't quite there. And because we've got that partnership and that network with our tried and trusted, uh, that tends to happen. But, we, you know, it has unlocked some, some good opportunities for us as well because there are some really, really good local operations that just work very uniquely in a certain geography that actually from a price point and a service point they're fantastic particularly wales there's some awesome hauliers uh, in wales that we use um, and they they very much need to get back to wales which again complements the data uh, and enables them to come back with a full load rather than uh, rather than empty so thank you very much um i think that's pretty much where we're at in terms of time so Final point from me is just to say a very big thank you from Martin and Tim. Um, we are over in the corner on the stand, guys with the uh, big orange t-shirts. 
um, on position E, if that makes any sense to you. Um, but scan the QR code to find out more. Um, that'll take you through to the, the website and, and all of the extra content that we've got. And by all means, come and see us later on. But thank you very much. Thank you, Tom. Thank you.